Hello and welcome to PostgreSQL, a weekly show about all things PostgreSQL. I am Michael, founder of PG Mustard. This is my co-host Nikolai, founder of Postgres AI. Hello, Nikolai. What are we talking about today? Hello, Michael. Uh, the RDS team just released a blog post about blue-green deployments, and I thought it's a good, good opportunity to discuss this topic in general and maybe RDS implementation particularly. Although I haven't used it myself, I've just read the blog post. But I quite like kind of quite know some issues uh, and problems this topic uh, has. So I thought it's a good moment to discuss those problems. Yeah, awesome. It's a it's a even if we look at the basics, is I think it's interesting to most people. Everyone has to make changes to their database. Everyone needs to deploy those changes. Uh, most people want to do that in as safe a way as possible with as little downtime as possible. So I think it's a good topic in general to revisit, and it looks interesting. Right, right. So I think, like in general, in general, it's a great direction of development of uh, methodologies, technologies, and, and ecosystem, like various tools and so on, because it, like it, uh, because bigger projects, not only the biggest projects, some smaller projects also need it, especially those who change things very often. But before we continue, I would like to split this topic to two subtopics. First is... Uh, uh, not frequent changes we do when we, we, for example, upgrade, perform major upgrade of Postgres or we switch to new operational system if we, if we, if we have self-managed Postgres uh, with uh, glibc version switch, right? Or, for example, we switch hardware, I don't know, like something like big, big changes. Or Great maybe we just... Upgrade. Yeah. All right. Or maybe we switch to... Uh, we try to enable data checksums, maybe also this is one of the... Yeah. It's generally possible with rolling upgrade approach when you just uh, change it on one replica and then another and then like, mm -hmm. like you know, rolling upgrade. But maybe this uh, idea of blue-green which came from uh, non, non from stateless uh, part of systems like, like to... Uh, originally, this idea was avoiding the topic of databases, but we will discuss it. So, uh, this is big class of changes which usually is performed by the infrastructure teams, and uh, it's like not very often, right? Few times yeah, per right. year, usually, right? Versus a different, very different category of problem, which is uh, changing our application code maybe several times per day trying to react to the market needs and uh, our compet competitors changes trying to move forward like go to market strategy and so on so s continuous deployment schema changes various stuff so obviously interesting that Original idea described by Martin Fowler is about the second thing, uh, schema changes and so on, like application changes, uh, which is done probably not infrastructure team, but engineering team or development, development team, uh, which is usually bigger in size and they need more often changes, but is the, each one of those changes is lighter, much more like it's not as heavy as major Postgres upgrade, right? And, but it's done. It's it's it, it needs to be done very often, and probably in fully automated fashion, like through CI/CD pipelines, continuous integration approach, right? So we just change it a lot of automated testing, and we just approve, merge, and it, it's already in production, right? So original idea by, by Martin Martin Fowler, and I think we need to start discussing it already, right? It's about the second problem for developers. While what the RDS team developed is for infrastructure team and major upgrades, it's a very different class of uh, tasks to solve, right? Do you agree? Yeah, I do. And I, I, I probably jump in the gun a little bit here, but I feel like they might be slightly misusing the phrase blue-green deployments for this, for the description of this feature. And I... I really like this feature. If I was on RDS, I think I would use it, especially for major version upgrades, 
Um, I think it makes that process really simple and lower downtime than most other options uh, smaller database users have. Um, but yeah, I completely agree that this is not at all appropriate for application teams wanting to roll up new features, add a column to a table, add an index. It just doesn't make sense. Because Logical doesn't support DDL replication yet, right? That's, yeah. that's why this is like stop, full stop, <laughs> hard stop. Oh, and even if it did, I think the the way that this is done wouldn't be appropriate. It would it would be too Here much. I would agree with you, but let's do it later. Right? Okay, like, cool. Just, just let, let make a mark that I have. Uh, I have multiple opinions here, not final, like, uh, you know, like, no final opinion. So I have different thoughts. Let, let, let's discuss it slightly later. So, okay, let's talk about the original idea, Blue Green. First of all, why such weird naming, which reminds me uh, red, red, black trees uh, in, from the algorithm and structure from computer science, basically. Binary trees, uh, and next idea is uh, red, black trees, and so on. So why, why, why have this name? You, 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 you've read about it, right? Yeah, I saw in a, an old Martin Fowler blog post that I'll link up that they, they had, I, I suspect, I didn't actually look at the timelines, but I suspect it was back from when they were consulting, I think probably at ThoughtWorks. That seems to be where a lot of these things have come from. Um, and they had some difficult to convince clients uh, that they wanted to increase the deployment frequency, uh, but people were scared of risk as always. And they had this idea that, well, we, I mean, it's it's kind of standard now, but I guess back in the day it wasn't as standard that staging needed to be as close to production as possible so that you could do some testing in it and deploy the change to production in as, as risk-free a manner as possible. And then they, that, they took that a bit further and said, well, what if staging was production, but with the only the change we wanted to make uh, different? And instead of making that change on production, we instead switched traffic to the... Uh, what we would previously have called the staging environment. And they they talked about naming for this, um, I don't even know what you'd call it, but methodology, I guess. And they thought about calling it AB deployments, which makes a lot of sense, but they well, didn't want to do it. AB means we split uh, our traffic, maybe only read-only traffic in the case of databases. And uh, we compare uh, to... to paths right for this traffic and well the main objection that here, martin the main objection martin had with that naming is it uh, they were scared the client would feel that there's a hierarchy there and if we talked about a uh, deploy if we talked about there being a problem and we were on the b instance instead of the a instance the question is why are we on the b one when the a was available and i think that's I, i'm not sure i think you're quite right that a b testing might have already been a loaded term at the time but it also is a good counter example where most people understand that in an A-B test, we're not assuming the, in a hierarchy between A and B. Right. But also the approach, uh, this approach says it will be this, the second cluster, like secondary cluster, which follows, okay, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, databases only, right? Let's, let's switch, like since we discuss uh, Mar Martin Fowler's ideas, mm -hmm. we should talk only about stateless parts of our system and the database we should touch only a little, right? So, okay, stateless. Uh, for example, we have a lot of application nodes and uh, some of them are our production, some other are not production. And what I'm trying to say, it's not only about hierarchy and which is like higher, of course. Um, so, yeah, by the way, it's, I remember it's a similar name. Okay, I, I, I'm a database guy. I remember if, if you give host name primary to your primary, but you, after failover, you don't switch names, it's, it's a stupid idea because <laughs> this replica now has, has host name primary. It's similar here, right? So we need, yeah. we need some, dis, we need this distinguish, but not to permanently say this is main one because we want them interchangeable, uh, symmetric. Right, so we switch there when the switch back, back and forth, and uh, always one of parts of the like one cluster is 
or one set of nodes is our our real production and another is considered as like a kind of powerful staging right but key questions not only about on, only about uh, hierarchy but how exactly is testing done uh, in one case we can consider okay if this is our staging and we send only test workload there which is is done for example from our qa uh, test sets from from pipelines or we consider this secondary cluster secondary node set as uh, part of production and put like for example one percent of whole traffic there this is very different testing strategies right so two different strategies i i think in, in original ideas it was like it's staging all production traffic goes to main node set blue or green depending on current state and uh, that's it right so it, uh, we cannot say it's a b because in a b we need to split 50 50 or 20 80 and then compare yeah you know, sometimes yeah. sometimes i like in in marketing i've heard people talk about a b testing which is concurrently testing two things at the same time and exactly. then sometimes they they call what this might be is cohort testing they say we're going to test this month. Uh, the timelines will be different, but if you wanted to test, if you wanted to to switch from blue to green in one go and send all traffic to the new one, that would be considered. It's not A B because it's not concurrent, but you you might say this okay. cohort is going to this new one. I, this cohort. I would say that they are both A B in my opinion because they are both okay. uh, use production traffic to test. So. This is exactly, by the way, the idea. We can switch there for one hour, then switch back, and then during next week study the results. For example, right? It's it makes sense to me. Or next hour, I don't know. And this, I don't, I don't really care if it's like concurrent or sequential. But the idea is we use production real traffic. It's a very powerful idea. Not only data or not only applications. Application nodes are configured exactly like on production because they are production sometimes right we, we switch them but also we use the real traffic to test uh, i think original idea was we don't do it we the, this second secondary uh, node set is used for lower environment it's still production data right or production it talks to production database but we generate traffic ourselves uh, like special special traffic special workloads uh, under control this is the idea the original idea like we do with staging but we know think, it's this is our final testing it's very powerful it uses the same database first of all so, so we should be careful not to send uh, emails not to call ex external apis and also to convince um, various auditors that it's fine because they always say if you do production testing maybe it's not a good idea like, who knows so but uh it's very powerful testing right but it's not done with production workloads yeah interesting and have you heard the phrase testing in production that this feels yeah. like a uh it's like a times. i do it all the time <laughs> yeah but i like it actually, yeah. yeah well it kind of feels like that Partly when we're switching over as well, because as much as test testing as we possibly done, most of us with a bit of experience know that as you can do all the testing in the world and production is just different. Like real users right. are just different. They will use it or uh, break it in ways you didn't imagine or have access patterns you just didn't exactly. imagine. So we kind of are testing. And I think that's one of the big promises of blue green deployments in the theoretical, or at least in the, in the stateless Not world. St st is stateless can, green. Let's, let's yeah. introduce this term stateless. Green. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that you can switch back if there's a problem that feels to me like a real core premise. Uh, and why it's so valuable is if something goes wrong, if you notice an issue really quickly, you can go back to the previous one. It's still alive. And uh, there are no, uh, ill effects of moving backwards and i think that's a tricky concept in the database world but we can we can get to that later yes and this is exactly let, let's continue with this i think we already covered the uh, most the major parts of the original mm -hmm. idea of stateless idea we can switch to stateful ideas and this is the first part where uh, the rds uh, blue green deployments implementation 
radically differs from the original stateless ideas. They, I, I noticed that from the very beginning of reading the article, they say, this is our blue, this is our green. And like they distinguish them. Yeah. It's it's different approach. It's not what uh, Martin Fowler talked to. D- very different. So, and obviously, like, I'm reading from this article, obviously the reverse replication is not supported, but it could be supported. It's possible, and actually we already implemented it a couple of times, and uh, I hope soon we will have good materials to be shared, but in general, you just, why not create, when you perform switchover, why not create a reverse replication and consider old cluster as a kind of staging now, not losing anything. And without this idea, it's one-way ticket, and this is not an enterprise solution, sorry. It's plain simple, well, it's, it's not an enterprise solution. It, it's definitely not, well, it's not blue-green either, <laughs> I don't think. Right. right. Um, but you're, it's an interesting well, point about scale. So if I'm if I'm using a small database, if I'm a little provider, so just a small business with a small database, and I'm doing a major version upgrade, and I want to be able to go backwards, it would be tricky to do with this, I think. Yeah, so uh, it's not tricky. It's tricky if you if you don't want data loss. You can go back, right? But you lose a lot of rights. <laughs> so well, but I can't do. Let's say if it's not a major version upgrade, if it's something like uh, uh, maybe changing a c- configuration parameter, I could do uh, what Amazon are calling blue to green. Change the parameter in the green one. Sw- switch to it. And then I can do it the same process again, switching it back. Um, but you lose data. New rights will be not replicated backwards. No, not back. So, so let's say I go blue to green, change the parameter on mm-hmm. green, switch over. Now I've realized there's a problem, and I want to. I set up a new one, a new green, <laughs> as they call it. Oh. Uh, and switch again. Well, well, like, well, okay, okay. In this case, uh, we deal with very basic example, which probably do, like uh, doesn't require so heavy solution to it because, uh, uh, like, depending on which parameter you want to test, uh, maybe you should just test it on one of replicas. Maybe you should just test it on the same uh, Postgres, uh, just minimizing downtime when you restart. It, it would be easier to just do that because, especially because the second. Uh, consideration uh, reading this article is, is that downtime is not zero. Yeah, that's a big So we start, we start is not zero, and here is also not zero. I, I, I don't remember if they mentioned the issue checkpoint to minimize downtime. I think no. In right? fact, that alone is probably enough for in your books to be to say it's not enterprise ready, right? And the, and to their credit, they well, do say it. They they do say low downtime switchover, right? They right. Don't, they're not trying to claim that it is right. If if we say that, if we if this is this is our characteristic, it's not zero downtime. It means that uh, this solution competes with uh, regular uh, restarts. That's it. <laughs> so why why should I need this uh, to test uh, to to see um, to to try to switch to different parameter i can do it uh, just with restarts right and not losing data not paying for extra cl- uh, extra machines and so on so but for major upgrades it's a different story you cannot uh, downgrade unfortunately there is no pg downgrade yeah. uh, tool uh, exactly <laughs> so you need uh, like you, you just need to use reverse logical replication and orchestrate it properly, and it's possible hundred percent. And this would mean, but not through it, Amazon it, right now. Like it's yeah, not, it's not implemented, yeah. but it's it's mm-hmm. solvable, and I think uh, like everyone can implement it. It's not diff- It's not easy. I know a lot of details. It's not easy, but it's definitely uh, doable. So what what were the tricky parts? Tricky parts are like if you need to deal with. Um, uh, we had a whole episode about logical, right? Yeah. So tricky part, the main tricky part is always not only like sequ- sequences or DDL replication. It's very very well known the limitations of current logical replication. Hopefully they will be solved. There is good work in progress for both problems. There are a few uh, additional problems which, uh, not. Um, uh, which are observed not in 
every cluster, but uh, these two usually observed in any cluster because everyone uses sequences, mm -hmm. even if they use uh, this new like syntax generated identity always like i don't remember i still use B B generated serial. always has identity i think yes yes but uh, uh, behind the scene it's also sequences actually and though everyone is uh, w like usually doing schema changes so these two problems are big limitations of current uh, logical replication but the most tricky the trickiest parts are um, the performance and legs uh, so to capacity limitations on both sides on publisher it's a wall sender uh i know like, like we discussed it right so yeah we can link up that episode yes yes so wall sender limitation and logical replication worker limitation and uh, you can have multiple logical replication workers and interesting that this is like actually that says that that article needs some polishing because they say uh, logical replication, max logical replication worker. Like I'm reading max logical replication worker, and I don't see S because it's plural, the setting. And I'm saying, hmm, in inaccuracy here. And then the whole sentence is saying, when you have a lot of tables in database, like this needs to be higher. And I'm thinking, oh, do you actually use multiple publications and multiple slots if I have a lot of tables automatically. This is super interesting because if you do, as we discussed in our logical yeah. application episode, you have big issues with uh, foreign key violation on the uh, logical replica side, right? On, on subscriber side, because by default foreign key is, is not followed when replicating tables using multiple poop soup streams, right? So, and this is a huge problem if you want to use such replica for some testing, even if it's not production traffic. You will see, like, okay, this row exists, but the pending row is not it's not created yet. Foreign key violated. And it's normal for logical replica, which is replicated by multiple uh, slots and subs publication subscriptions. So, so not discussing this problem means that probably there are limitations also at large scale if you have if you have a lot of tables it's not a problem actually the biggest problem is uh, how many tuple writes you have per second this okay. is the biggest problem roughly like thousand or couple of thousands of tuple writes of, on modern hardware with a lot of vcpus like 64 128 or 96 I'm talking Intel numbers, usual Intel numbers. Uh, you will see lo uh, single logical replication worker will hit 100% CPU. And that's nasty problem. That's a huge problem because, because you switch to multiple workers, but now your foreign keys are broken. It's hard to solve problem for testing. So, I mean, if you use multiple, you need to pause sometimes to wait until consistency is reached and then test in frozen mode. This is okay, but it, it, it adds complexity. But if your traffic, if your traffic below like thousand tuple per second, roughly, depending also, is it Intel? But by the way, it doesn't matter how many cores because we I talk here about limitation of single core. Uh, it, it matters only uh, like is it. Uh, like modern core or quite outdated on, on the family. It depends uh, if you talk about AWS on the family of EC2 instances you, you try to use or RDS instances you try to use. So this single core limitation on the subscriber side is quite interesting. But if you have below 1000 tuple per second writes in search of dead deletes, probably you're fine. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, interesting to check. And this lagging is, the, the, I think, the biggest problem. Because when you switch over, you need to catch up. When you install a reverse logical replication, you also need to make sure you catch up. And this defines the downtime, actually. Yeah, because uh, we can't uh, switch uh, back until... We can't switch or switch back until the other one has caught up. Right, we because we prioritize... Break. We prioritize uh, avoidance of data loss over HA here, over yeah. high availability here. And I, I, I'm sure since RDS, the RDS blog post talks about 
you know, like it's not zero downtime, they have additional overhead. But if you have, for example, PG browser and uh, you are going to use pause resume to achieve real zero down, downtime, then you need uh, the lag to be close to zero. And uh, the limitations of logical application worker will be number one problem. Another problem is lo- long running transactions, which until Postgres 16, I think, right, uh, cannot be parallelized and like, or 15. So if you have long transaction, you have a big uh, logical replication lag. So yeah, you there need was to some... wait, <laughs> wait until you have good opportunity to like to switch over with lower downtime. That's one thing I think I do want to give them some credit for. They this this does catch some of those. So, for example, if it does, if you do have long running transactions, they'll they'll prevent you from switching over. Equally, there's a few other cases where they'll stop you from. Uh, causing yourself issues, which is is quite nice. And I, I wanted to give a shout out to the like Postgres core team and everybody working on features to improve logical application has enabled cloud providers to p- start to provide features like this. And that's really cool. It's this feels like the the good features yeah. going into Postgres core are enabling cloud providers to to work at the level they should be working at to add additional functionality. So it's quite a cool like uh, success. Not necessarily that we're there yet and as logical replication improves so can this improve but they are checking for things like long running transactions which is cool yeah and definitely Amit Kapil and others who work on logical replication kudos to them 100% and also RDS team I'm, I'm criticizing a lot but you know like it's hard to criticize someone who is doing nothing, right? You cannot criticize <laughs> such guys who do not, don't do anything. So the fact that they move in this direction is super cool in general because, like, it shows, like, a lot of problems, right? But these problems are solvable, right? And eventually we might have a real blue, like, like the question, is the blue-green blue green deployment terminology going to stay in the area of databases and Postgres ecosystem in particular? What do you think? Because this is a sign that probably, yes, it should be reworked a lot, I think. But in general, maybe yes. What do you think? I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, obviously, uh, predicting the future is difficult. But I do think that badly naming things in the early days makes it less likely. Like Calling this blue-green when it's not actually, I think, reduces people's trust in you using blue green later in the future when when it is more like that um mm. but you you've got more experience with this than me uh, in the for example in the category so, of database branching like de- defining the, like taking these developer uh terms that people have a lot of prior uh, assumptions about and then using them in a database context that they don't 100 percent apply to or they're much more difficult in i think is is dangerous but equally what choice do we have? Like, how how else would you describe this kind of thing? Like, is there maybe it's a marketing thing? I'm not sure. That's cool direction of thinking. So, let me show you some analogy. Analogy. Uh, until some time, not not many years ago, I thought, as many others, that uh, changing something, we need to perform full fledged benchmarking. Like, for example, if we drop some index, we need to check that all our queries. Uh, are okay in this case okay we like we can do it with pg bench sys bench jmeter or anything like we or simulate workload with our own application using multiple application nodes a lot of sessions like running like 50 percent cpu and we and this is just to test uh, the an, an attempt to drop index it's it sounds overkill like i mean nobody is doing it actually because it's too expensive but people think in this direction, like we would, it would be good to test like holistically. But actually, there is another approach: lean benchmarking, single session, explain analyze buffers, focus on buffers, I/O, and so on. Similar here, and, and first class of testing is needed for an infra tasks, mostly upgrades and so on, to compare the whole system, uh, lock manager, buffer pool behavior, everything, file system, disk, everything. And the second system, but it's needed only, as I said, like once 
per quarter, for example, a few times per week. Of course, for every cluster, if you have thousands, thousands of clusters, you need it almost daily, I think, right? So to run, to, to run such benchmarks. And similar are these up upgrades, major upgrades, and so on. These tasks uh, go together, usually. You need upgrades, so you need to do benchmark. But for small schema changes, you do it every day, multiple times, maybe. Okay, once per week, maybe, depending on the project. You release often. You develop your application quickly. You don't need full-fledged benchmarks, and you also probably don't need uh, full-fledged blue-green deployments, right? But maybe you need, I don't know, maybe you need, uh, still need it. It's, this is where I said I have open-ended questions like what should we use for better testing? Because I could, like, if we are okay to pay two times more, we could have two clusters with uh, one-way replication, but when we switch, perform switchover, zero downtime switchover, immediately we set up reverse application. So real blue-green approach. In this case, probably we could use them for DDL as well. Of course, DDL should be solved, but we can solve it uh, applying DDL manually on both sides, actually. This unblocks logical replication. So we like we, we just need to control DDL additionally, not just alter. We need to alter there and alter here. In this case, probably it would be a great tool to test everything. And then if we go, like if we diverge, slightly diverge from blue-green deployments idea, but use a B testing idea. So we point like 1% of traffic to this cluster, read-only traffic only. I'm not going to work with like active-active schema, uh, like multi-master, no, no, no. So when we can, then we can test at least or it only traffic for change schema. Uh, but again, the, there will be problem with schema replication because logical replication is going to be blocked. We cannot, we need to deploy you know, uh, the schema change on both. Uh, it's not only about uh, the lack of logical replication of DDL, it's also about even if DDL would be also replicated, if you deploy it only on one side it don't deploy it on another side, logical replication is not working or it replicates it, right? So I'm not quite it... sure. Ah, actually, we can drop index on the subscriber or we can add a column on subscriber it, and the logical replication will be still working. But uh, some certain cases of DDL will be hard to test in this approach. But still, imagine such approach. It will be full-fledged blue-green deployment with simple, like symmetric schema, simple switch back and forth, uh, reliable. I, I don't know, like maybe it's a good way to handle all changes in in general, we just paid two times more, but for some people it's fine if if the costs of error and risks are, uh, costs of uh, problems are higher than this. What do you think? Yeah, this is a tricky one. I, uh, the first company, the first database related company I worked for was, uh, did a lot of work in the uh, schema change management tooling area. Uh, not for Postgres, but for other databases. And it gets really complicated fast just trying to manage versions between, like just trying to manage deployments to, between versions of maintaining data. And the concept of rolling back is a really strange one. Like if going, if going backwards, let's say you've deployed a, a simple change. You've added a column for a new feature. You've gathered some data. Does rolling back, like, maybe temporarily involve dropping that column? I, I don't think so, because then you destroy that data. But then it's now in the old version as well, and there's this weird third version. I the, I often talked about, in, in the past, rolling forwards rather than rolling back, and I think that's gained quite a lot of uh, steam in the past few years. The idea that you can't, re like with data, can you actually roll back? Because do you really want to drop that data? Yeah, you know, dro dropping column doesn't uh, remove data, you know it, right? Because that's why it's fast. <laughs> but it's not a story. Well, this approach with reshape and now how this new tool is new tool is called uh, to handle DDL in the reshape model. When it's similar to what plain, plain scale does with MySQL, the whole table is uh, 
uh, recreated additionally, so you need two, time more, two times more storage, and we have a view which masks this machinery, right? And then uh, we, like in chunks, we just update something. There you can have ability to roll back, right? Because it's this, maintaining it in both places? Because you, for some period of time, you have both versions yeah. working and synchronized on, inside one cluster. But this, the pr price is quite high and uh, views have uh, limitations, right? But here, if we talk about like we're replicating whole cluster, or oh, the price is even higher. Yeah, so. and the complexity is even higher, I think. Of course, yes. Managing definitely. it within one database feels complex already to me. It's called Pidgerol. Oh, nice. A, a new tool which like, uh, is a further development of that idea of uh, the reshape tool. So, cool. which is not developed as, as I know, because the the creator of that tool, Reshape, uh, went to work into some high, bigger company, not Postgres user. So, unfortunately, so uh, I don't know. Like, the problem exists. People want uh, to simplify schema changes and uh, be able to revert them easily. And right now, we do it. Hard, I mean, hard in, in, in terms of physical implementation way. I mean, we, if we say revert, we definitely revert. But dropping, dropping column is not, are usually considered as non-revertable uh, step. And it's, usually it's quite known. When, like, people usually design in larger projects, they usually design so, like, first application stops using the column. And a month later, you drop it, and then already you know so it's I'm not needed. I'm actually talking about adding a column, which is way more common. Well, I'm talking about adding case, a column because you need to because if you need to support rolling back, that becomes dropping a column. Okay, well, so what's the problem? Data loss if you do roll back or what? Yeah. Oh, you you want to uh, move forth then back then forth again without data loss. Possibly. You, you, you want too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so, do, so do, I think that's like we talked about blue green deployments, right? Let's say part of what you're doing is rolling out a new feature and so you roll it out for a few hours and some of your customers start using that feature, but then there's a major, it's causing a major issue in the rest of your system. So you want to roll back. Does, does that use of that feature, are we willing to, to scrap those users? Uh, work while we like in order to fix the rest of the system. I think people would want to retain that data. Yeah, well, let's let's discuss it in detail. First of all, on subscriber we can add a column. If it has default, logical replication won't be broken because it will be just inserting, updating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we have extra column, so what? Not not a problem, right? But when we switch forth in uh, setup of Reverse replication will be hard because we have now extra columns, so and our old cluster doesn't have it. So we cannot replicate this table. Uh, in unless we logic, replicate DDL, which if we start replicating DDL backwards, then we're kind of reverting to our existing state, right? Right. Which is strange. The, this is one option. Yes, and another option is to. I know there is an ability to fill the rows and columns, I guess, right? So you can replicate only specific columns, right? I yep. never did, did, did it myself, but I think... Quite new. Is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you replicate only a limited set of columns, you're fine. But in this case, uh, moving forth again, will like you, you lose this data. And it's similar to what you do with Flyway, Sketch, Liquibase, or Redis migrations. Usually you define up and down or like... How upgrade downgrade steps? In this case, you create column, alter table, add column, then alter table, drop column, and if you go, if you went back, of course you lost data which was inserted already, and it's considered normal actually usually. Like well, yeah. So, but that's that's my background as well. Is that pe people often wouldn't end up actually using the rollback scripts. What they would do is roll forwards. They would oh. end up with an old version of the application, but the column and the data are still there in the, in the, with the data. You database. talk about people who closely, like you, you talk about 
companies who are both developers and users of this system. But if you imagine some system which is developed and like, for example, installed in many places, mm -hmm. some software, they definitely sure. need a downgrade uh, procedure to be automated, even with that data loss, because it's more important usually to like fix system and make it alive again. And peop users in this case not necessarily understand details because they are not developers. And it's okay to lose this data and downgrade, but make system healthy again, right? In this case, we like in this case we are okay with this data loss. Right? Cool. Is there anything? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I, I guess going back to the original topic, I, you asked, do we? Do I think blue green deployments will take on take off in data, database world? And I think it's the switching back that's tricky. But I don't want to diminish this work that's been done here, regardless of what we call it, because I think it will make more people able to do major version upgrades specifically with less downtime than previously they would have been able to, um, even, even though it will still be a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we, sh we need to develop the idea further and uh, consider this blue-green uh, concept as some like intermediate. Like uh, as I said, I, I like it reminds me. Uh, uh, it reminds me red black trees, right? In like binary tree, like, red black tree, then AVL tree, and so on. Like and then finally B tree, and this is like development of the uh, like indexing also uh, approaches, uh, algorithms, and data structures. So maybe like closer to self balancing than a lot of children for each. No, maybe here also, like it's very distant analogy, of course, because uh, we talk about architectures here, but maybe these blue, green, blue, blue, green deployments or green, green, blue deployments. I think we should start mixing this. Yeah. To, to, <laughs> to, to, to emphasize that they are balanced, right? And symmetric. Um, and uh, also like say, tell RDS guys that uh, it's not fair to consider one of them as always source and another is always target. We need to balance them. So uh, uh, I think there should be some new concepts also developed. So it's interesting to me. I don't know how like, how the future will be will look like. Also, let it, let me tell you a story about naming. In our systems we developed, we chose like we know like. Pra master slave in the past and primary uh, secondary or primary standby official postgres documentation follows this terminology right now writer writer reader in uh, aurora terminology uh, also leader follower patroni terminology uh, then logical application terminology publisher subscriber here we have blue green right in our development we chose source target clusters and it was definitely fine in everywhere, in monitoring and all testing, like everyone understands, this is our source cluster, this is our target cluster. But then we implemented reverse logical replication to support uh, moving back. And mm -hmm. it was like source target clusters naming showed it's the wrong idea immediately, right? So I started to think in our particular case, we do it like we set up these clusters temporarily. It might be temporarily mean, might mean multiple days, but not persistent, not forever. In the original blue green deployment, as I understand Fowler, if I understand correctly, it's forever, right? We just this is production, this is staging, then we switch. Uh, so I I chose the na new naming is old cluster, new cluster, right? But if it's persistent, it's also bad naming. Yeah, maybe blue green is is okay. <laughs> green blue blue green, but uh, definitely, why uh, yeah. Why don't you use the Excel uh, naming convention with the final final v two at the end? This is the <laughs> final yeah, server. This is the final final server. So naming is hardly not right. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. I think that's okay. Good it was good. I, I I enjoy this. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, everybody, and catch you next week. Yeah. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Share is the most important, I think, or like is the most important. What is it? Like, we don't I think see comments. A... Comments are the most important to me anyway. Like, let us know what comments. you think in, the, in YouTube, like uh, comments maybe, or on Twitter, or on, 
on Mastodon. You know, I wanted to take a moment and uh, emphasize that uh, our we continue working on subtitles. Subtitles, they are great. They are high quality. Yesterday, I asked in a Russian-speaking Telegram channel where eleven thousand people talk about Postgres. I asked them if uh, to check YouTube. Uh, and because we have good quality English subtitles, we, they understand terms. We have 240 uh, t- terms in our glossary. We feed our like AI based pipeline to generate subtitles. Uh, and I wanted to say, my, uh, to say thank you to my son who is helping with this actually, uh, uh, who is uh, still like teenager school, but uh, also learning Python and so on. So, uh, YouTube provides automated generation to any language. So it, to me, the most important is sharing because this delivers our content to more people. And if those people cannot understand English very well, especially with two very weird accents, or British yeah, and Russian, sorry about right? that. The, the, yes. So it's good to just on YouTube to switch to automated generated subtitles in any language and uh, people say it's quite good and understandable. So Great. share and tell them that even if they don't understand English, they can consume this content. And then maybe if they have ideas, they can write us. Perfect. But this is this is the way. Right. Thank you so much. Bye bye.